the message this morning is the need for another reformation the need for another reformation and I'm really not talking about particularly what happened 500 years ago I'm talking about a personal reformation of the heart uh, I, I me and Morgan were were transformed with our trip recent trip to New York and just going to the Brooklyn Tabernacle and seeing their Tuesday night prayer service and 3,000 people worshiping and and just it just uh, came back just with a renewed passion uh, for what God can really do uh, in, a, in a church that's on fire for him and uh, looking at and talking with the people there the need for a, a personal reformation is, is actually a greater need than a, a, another reformation. I'm going to explain what I mean by that in just a minute. Because when, when I put up the title, The Need for a Reformation, most of us are like saying, Amen, bro, brother, preach it. <laughs> the churches need to be changed. Uh, the political system needs to be changed. I can get a huge amen on that one for sure. Uh, so many things. Yes, yes, reformation. But we forget that it actually starts here. Reforming our own heart that reforms the, the home that ref reforms our marriages. And what I mean by reformation is this. It's a, it's a reforming, a renewing, a restoring, a reviving of guess what? The truth. Anytime, the word reform, I instantly thought of concrete. Not everybody will know what I mean by that, but you, you construction guys, uh, especially in concrete, you will know what I'm talking about. Reforming. You, you, I remember many times I would come out and I would dig footings so they could put their forms and then once they looked they looked at the plans a little closer they oh we're off a foot so Shane can you backfill the dirt and compact it uh, very very good so it's because we're actually in the house foundation now compact that and read do what remove those forms and reform it reshape it according to the truth outlined in the archaeological in the archaeological in the uh, plans that the um, you know the archaeological the uh, I knew that word was going to get me. Architect, thank you. My goodness. The architect, the plans, because who goes off of those plans? Right? I mean, the plumber can't say, well, I'm going to do, well, I'm going to put the restroom over here. And the electrician, well, I'm going to wire here. And the uh, roofer, I, I think the roof should go over here. I mean, who, who does that? Never. Everybody goes off of the, the actually the stamped set of plans, the, the most recent set of plans. And that's what we have to do off in our own lives is to reform, to renew, to reshape, to get back on track. What we're celebrating after the second service and what the message is really centered around is what happened 500 years ago. On October 31st, uh, not everybody celebrates Halloween. Sometimes we celebrate the Reformation, right? Um, that's a whole other topic. But what happened 500 years ago? Uh, well, a person by the name of Martin Luther... Uh, a, a monk who was actually in the Roman Catholic Church uh, started to read the Word of God and was actually saved by the verse that the just shall live by faith. And he was saved. And as a result, when you're saved and when you're looking at the Bible, uh, you'll see some inconsistencies within the established church. So he actually went, uh, actually, uh, actually uh, protesting and went against the church. He had the audacity to what? And hammer the 95 thesis on the church doors of Wittenberg, Germany in 1517. These are all the grievances with the church that they need to go back to. Let me pull this out, good reminder, right? That, hey, what does this say? Not what does everybody else, what is, because actually when it gets away from this, anything goes. Anything goes. And that's when, when I, uh, many of you saw the, the interview on Fox News that I did with a pastor who embraces the LGBT agenda and, and actually allows, you know, anything to, to well, I'm going to not go there. Let me, I'm going to be careful. Uh, but what happens is it, the whole battle was over this. You know, this is changing. It really doesn't mean that anymore. We can kind of, we have a new truth now, a new revelation of what God is doing. Where does that end? Because what you think, then what, well, what, what he's telling me, well, what he's telling Pat and Chris and Mike, it's all different. You no, know, see, it has to go back to the foundation, back to the truth. So that's what we celebrate, uh, and believe it or not, um, it actually didn't start with Martin Luther. It started, uh, well, let me, let me just briefly talk about three different errors that, they, that we, church, in church and history, in church history, what they look at is the apostolic era 
It's when they, the church was born. Uh, then there's a church father's era, uh, when people like Polycarp, Justin Martyr, uh, Ignatius, uh, Irenaeus, uh, uh, different church fathers in the early first, second, third centuries, uh, their writings, we look to them. And it's interesting, we were all part of the Catholic church initially. Okay, good, nobody left yet. Right. It, that, that, just means Rome, that just means universal church. We are all part of that. And then around, <clears throat> oh gosh, 391 or so AD, Rome married the church. And that then became the position of power and authority. And that's where many people uh, <clears throat> believe that a lot of the corruption came in uh, around that time. And then that's when it became the Roman Catholic Church. And then, in my opinion, because that's one argument, they say, well, the Roman Catholic Church would say that our history is right from the apostolic era. Uh, Shane, right when Jesus built his church, but you guys started 500 years ago. And I usually say, no, we're actually, we go back 2,000 years ago to what Christ said, what the church was built upon, the word of God. So in that time, though, I think there was reformation. People were going back to the Word of God. There were true you know, people following what God said. We just don't have a lot of re recorded history. And then we get to around the 1380s, 80, 1384, John Wycliffe uh, died. He had a stroke. He actually started to translate the Bible into the common tongue of the people. That was not a good idea. It was in Latin, and they didn't want the people knowing the Bible. That in and of itself should, should tell you a lot. I made a promise today I wasn't going to rail on different religions or different things, but I, I'm just, here's the truth, that it was in Latin. So people like John Wycliffe, <clears throat> who was called the morning star of the Reformation for this very reason. And then people like, have you heard William Tyndall? Tyndall House. Uh, John Huss. Uh, actually, Huss means goose. And when you get, we get that phrase, uh, your goose is cooked from that, William Tyndale and John Huss were actually burned at the stake for translating the Bible. Heretical, heretics, because they dared to challenge the established religious system of the day. A lot to think about. To, to be chained to a stake with wood underneath you and set on fire. See, so there, the, the, this disagreement runs pretty deep between Protestants and Roman Catholics. It's a pretty deep little hurt there, you know? And, 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 and I'm invited sometimes to ecumenical things. Can't we all just get along? And we can all get along when the foundation is Scripture. If you go back to Scripture, then uh, groups can get along. And Protestant comes from the word protest. So they protested what was being taught in the church at that time. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background. So it's not some new movement that sprung out of the spirit of rebellion. It actually was wanting to always go back to the initial teachings of the church and the initial teachings of Christ. So a couple scriptures we're going to put up on the screen when we talk about reviving, renewing, restoring, going back to the truth. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. The sum of your word, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Forever. Did you catch that? It doesn't change. It doesn't, it's not relative based on our situation. And then John 17, Jesus says, sanctify them in the what? Relativism? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth truth that's why a slogan we've always had here at Westside Christian Fellowship is times change but truth does not see it's the only sure foundation Jesus built the church on the truth we are to be sanctified which is to be cleansed to be renewed to be restored by the truth and then we look at John 1 and the word which is Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory the glory as the only son from the father full of grace only wait a minute that's a big teaching right now just grace just grace just mercy that's it no there's an end in there grace and truth so you have to have that I would be miserable if I didn't have that if I believed in ongoing revelation and that things change, I would, you would probably have to lock me up. Because what do, you, what do you bank your life on? What do you raise your kids in? 
What do you go back to when you're drifting? Thank God for truth. Thank God. People died because of this, and we take it so uh, nonchalantly today. I have eight of them. Really? There's people in China, when they receive these, they start crying. And I've been reading, my friend who does missions work there sometimes, they get through the Bible once every three months, and again, and again, and again, like four, five, six times a year. I'm like, wow, how do they find so much time? See, it's not finding the time, it's the priority. How many of you just spent three hours watching something last night that is over? You watch a guy lick his bat, but we won't read the word of God. It's an inside joke. I just still don't understand that. But, but I'm being serious. We, see, we have the time. It's not the time. It's the priority. If we, this is God's, see, you have to have that truth in your life. Because without it, you start to drift. So God, I got to go back. What do you say? Oh, that's right. That's right. And it brings you back to what his word is. John 8, if you abide in my word and you are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you want to be set free of many things this morning? Now it's interesting here, to know the truth, here's where we make the mistake. You can study this word in the Greek. There's a whole Bible dictionary on these things. But many times we think, you know what, I know it but Shane, I'm not set free. Actually knowing in this context is to apply it. We have to, if, if you apply the truth, you will be set free. If you apply it, even the de demonic realm knows what the truth is, but they don't apply it. So the power comes in the application. That's why I always say that. So the true church, the true church, because everybody claims it, right? There's a church down the street. That's the true, true, true church. Jehovah Witness, that's the true, true church. Uh, Seventh-day Adventist, that's the true church. Uh, Roman Catholicism, that's the true church. I actually had, I had a quote on here. I took it out this morning. I probably should have left it. From Catholicism.org that says there's no salvation actually outside of the Roman Catholic Church. And so, see, I'm not, and people say, why are you, why are you putting, and I get mean, but I'm just this. Now, if I'm telling a lie, call me on it. If I'm saying something that's incorrect, tell me. But if this is all true, and it's just facts, why do people get upset? The true church was built 2,000 years ago, and it holds to Christ's teachings. Not perfectly, but we tighten our grip when necessary. It's, it's interesting. I'm glad I don't do this ever again. I'll never forget it. It's the first time I've had a heat stroke. There was something at our fair in town known as the Rural Olympics. And there was east side against west side tug of war. You guys remember that? And guess who they asked to be on the tug of war team? I didn't know you could hold a rope and pull so long, I mean, for so long. I mean, you think a tug of war is over, right? A couple seconds. I think this was like five, six minutes of pulling as hard as you can. And they had the bodybuilders against the farmers, and the farmers won. It's interesting. Uh, I think Troy Green, many of you, I just talked to him yesterday in Idaho. Um, he was on the team. He was a big anchor, I think 6'5", 350 pounds or something. And we thought we could win, but it, it, the, the, you kept losing your grip. You know, you, and you couldn't, you, you, it just, you, your hands were falling. And I was just, you know, falling. And then finally, I, I had a heat stroke afterwards. And, but just tightening, but it reminded me of truth. You have to go back and you tighten your grip around the truth. Okay, I'm, I'm falling off course. I'm losing. I have to come back and tighten my grip. On this, so that's the true church. It, it, the true church is throughout all of the world. We can, I can take you to India or or South America, or Uganda, and the true church. Are, are the brothers and sisters in Christ are there because they love the Lord, they've repented of their sin, and they believe. So be very careful of any church that tells you you have to belong to our church, you have to be baptized by our person, you have to say the right things. So from this reformation, 500 years ago, came five things that are important and you should probably know about. Many of you already do know about it. <clears throat> Number one, sola scriptura. 
Sola, all these come from the Latin, of course. Sola meaning singular, one person. Sola Scriptura. And what they meant by that is Scripture alone. The reason is because papal authority, the Pope, actually could decree things that, were, that superseded the Bible. Okay, it's, it's not really what this says, it's what they decree. So that became the standard of authority, not the Bible. So you have to go back to sola scriptura, the, the, the inerrancy of scripture, 2 Timothy 3.6. I think there's a handout that you all have with these verses, 2 Timothy 3.16 actually. From the King James, I learned a lot of these in the King James, so I use that, that Bible from time to time. Um, and you know what, I should maybe throw this out there for those listening, uh, for you that are curious. People, probably one of the top questions I get is what translation is best? Uh, so that is actually on our website. I went through an hour teaching on what translation is best or what translation or should you use? What's the difference? How do we get our Bible? It's on our website if you search for that. Uh, King James, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, not a perfect person, but complete in everything they do, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So that's the point of scripture. See, it's interesting. It's profitable for doctrine. Okay, do you want to know the heart of God and how to live? It's profitable for that. Do you want to um, reprove somebody? Hopefully you don't want to. Hopefully it just comes from time to time. And that's why preaching sometimes gets a, 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 a bad mark. Oh, it's, it's correcting me. It's, it's convicting me. Can't you guys just tell me what I want to hear? It doesn't do that. It reproofs. It rebukes. It, it corrects. Off, isn't it interesting? Rebuking, a doctrine, correction, instruction, and righteousness with how to live. Those four things tell me it's going to be challenging more often than it's encouraging. Because we're often off track, and to get back on track, see, it's not like we're always walking on track. And sometimes we do need encouragement. We need to be built up. We need, and to me, when I'm convicted, I change, I am built up. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> You know, it's not always just beating up, beating, but it, it, it's profitable for correction and instruction and righteousness that you may be thoroughly furnished, that you have everything you need. So I, I could spend a whole sermon on this, but I pulled something from gotquestions.org because the question always comes up. Shane, you just believe in a book that was put together by men. Some men met at a council and they said, hmm, I think this one's good. I think this one's good. I think this one's good. A couple things you need to know for sure. The letters of Paul, the, the letters from John, the, uh, the, the Jude, and, and these different books of the Bible, they were already being used by the early church in the first century, in the second century, in the third century. These letters were viewed as canonical, being, being, can, being, being authoritative in the New Testament. They already had the Old Testament. That was a given. The books of the Old Testament were a given. They've been passed down for, for hundreds of years. The New Testament, these are just letters that we've all, the church was already using. So when the council meant, I don't want to give you the exact date, 300-something A.D., they just, they just said, here's the books that the church has already been recognizing. So see, they didn't bring in all these, because that's what people will say to get you off track. And actually, when people say things, they don't really know what they're talking about. They, they, if you challenge them on things, uh, name one verse of the Bible that's wrong. Well, that's what I've been told. Well, council met, and they did this. Well, what council was that? How'd they go about doing it? So see, they just, they just throw things out there. So you need to know that. You also need to know for Bible, or gotquestions.org, for a book of the Bible to qualify, the author had to be an apostle or had a close connection with the apostle. The book was accepted by the body of Christ at large, by the early church. The book contains consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching. The book bears evidence of high moral spiritual values that would reflect the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why they say it's, it's not really uh, 66 books. It's one book written by one author. So you have all these, these books that match the authoritative. And then the, the Catholic Bible has something called the Apocrypha. And they throw in Maccabees. They throw in different books of the Bible. Interesting reads uh, sometimes, but they're not authoritative. We don't look at those as being, uh, being uh, ordained by God to be the canon of Scripture. Uh, and, and many books, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll th uh, like the Da Vinci Code, I think that was one. And these different, they'll throw out, what about this book? It says Jesus was married. 
well, what about this book? It says this, but is it consistent with Scripture? And how many years ago it was written? A lot of this is, is fake and, and, and fake news. We had, they had fake news back then, too. So that's where the Scriptures come from. Sola Scriptura. Then the second point, sola fide. Forgive me if I don't pronounce these correctly. I didn't look at my Latin translation. Sola fide, faith alone. Faith alone. So see, you have Scripture, and then you have faith alone. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, all of you that are believers, being justified by faith. See, that's how we're justified. But the church was teaching that you're justified by what? Works. Oh, I did so many works for God today. I'm going to go to heaven. That's, that's not biblical. So faith alone. Faith alone is this. God, I believe you are who you said you are. I believe that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I repent of my sin. I confess Christ as Savior and Lord. I believe in my heart. I have faith that you are sufficient and a person is saved. But see, the works flow from it. Because I don't know anybody that's truly saved that doesn't do works. You can't. It's like you have the Holy Spirit now in you. It's like, Shane, we've got to do works. We've got to do works. You've got to. I mean, every, when you're full of the Spirit, everywhere you go, you want to talk about Christ. The person on the corner, the person here that's the door. It's just this work of God. There's fruit everywhere because of the correct branch that is within you. The correct fruit. And that's the argument. They say, oh, all you guys do is, is Protestants, you preach faith and faith and faith. You minimize works. You, you, you just sit at home and have faith. No, your faith has, has feet. You show me your faith. See, they say, show me your faith by my works. We say, no, we'll show you faith because of faith alone, and we work. We have works because of our faith. So that was one of the sticking points. It's faith alone. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Something is very interesting. If you just have works, 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 and don't know Christ, you have no peace. I asked somebody, he got upset at me at the gym a couple years ago, Jehovah Witness. Do you know where you're going? No. I don't, and I won't know until I get there. Do you have peace? No. He's an angry man. No peace, no hope, but a lot of works. And he was mad about those works. So you see, if it's just, because what, how, if you just stop and think for a minute, when does it, I gotta do, God, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, and, and God's gonna not sit and look at us in heaven and go, gosh, you did do a lot of works. You did a lot of bad things too, and let me just weigh these on a scale. Now, I'd be miserable, wouldn't you? Because you're, each day, oh, <laughs> did I do it? Did I, my, my, my mind's thinking bad things. Oh, that, that, now I gotta do another good work. I do a few good works, but then now I'm doing the good works because of pride and ego. Now that I'm actually in sin, so they're not good works. They don't even count. Because let's be honest, how many of our good works are really good works straight from the heart? I'll just leave you, I'll just let you chew on that one. So faith alone, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. So we go back to faith and faith alone. Sola gratia, sola gratia, grace alone. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it's by grace alone, again, not by work. So the, the, Martin Luther was going back to this, actually John Calvin, uh, Eurek Zwingli in Switzerland, John Knox in Scotland, they were going all back to this truth. Solo Christo, solo Christo, and it's solo instead of sola because it's a masculine form there, solo Christo, Christ alone. Now this might seem odd to some of us, but back then it was Christ plus certain things. Christ plus I have to do these things. So I said, no, it's, it's Christ alone. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. That's pretty narrow. So see, they were going back to that because they're teaching the people, just go to Christ, Christ alone, not these things. And, and they had things where you could actually um, put, put money into a, a coffer, put money into a, into, into a box or something, and you could spring 
your relatives and friends out of, of purgatory. More money, quicker they'll be out. I mean, can you see why this just infuriated true believers? I mean, purgatory is not even a biblical concept. And I, I mentioned before, when I met with a priest down in Santa Clarita of a large church, 4,000 people church, and I asked him, what about purgatory? He goes, well, Shane, our, our shame and guilt has to be done with somehow. Did you catch that? We have to go to purgatory because our shame and guilt has to be dealt with somehow. <laughs> that, that dealt with it. That dealt with everything. So you don't have to go somewhere and get punished for your sins for a certain time. It's already been paid. See, none of that's biblical. So that's why people get passionate. They get upset because it's not correct. You're leading people down a false road. And then the fifth one, where I'd want to just camp out a minute. Soli Deo Gloria. Again, forgive my pronunciation. Soli Deo Gloria. To the glory of God alone. To the glory of God alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the English Standard Version. So whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. See, individual reformation leads to larger change. Individual reformation. And I will tell you this, as a living witness, <laughs> no reformation will occur without accepting the Holy Spirit's correction and guidance. No reformation will start in your heart in the church without accepting the Holy Spirit's correction and His guidance. Many of you have heard the, the verse, and we've taught it, taught it many times, that, that salt, about salt losing its, its savor, right? Losing its flavor. Jesus said that. How will, how will uh, you be any good if that salt loses its, 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 its savor? That, 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 you know, when you taste salt, that, that saltiness that it has. A, a light isn't, isn't meant to be put underneath a bushel. It's meant to be uh, shown but I started to think about this week. How does salt lose its savor? How does it lose its preserving effect? How do churches, how do pastors, Christians fall away? Depending on your theology, if they fall away or if they don't fall away, the bottom line is we can walk away from God. We can begin to get carnal in our thinking. We can begin to drift our salt loses its effectiveness. Have you ever had salt that's no good? I think it's, uh, it's I don't know the, the chemical makeup, but chlorine dioxide or something, uh, sodium dioxide. But the, the salt, there's two ways, interesting, I looked this up, two ways that salt can lose its savor, can lose its effect. The first is an outside influence. Try dipping your salt in water. And then take it and then put it on meat. Put it, you won't even taste it. Same thing with the believer. Same thing with you in this room. An outside influence can come in and begin to, to quench that work of God. Begin to quench and grieve what God is doing. It, it takes all the savor away. It's an outside influence. And then the second thing, an internal change in our taste buds. Something can happen on the inside. So see, salt loses its effectiveness by what's coming on the outside, and guess what else? What's coming from the inside. Something within us can change it. So if the taste buds, when a person's sick, have you ever noticed, or if they told you, I, I just don't taste the things anymore. I, I can't taste that. One of the interesting things that happened to me over the years of, of fasting and different things is now I crave broccoli. I crave bell peppers cut up and put into hummus. What, 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 what my taste buds used to hate that. What happened? Something changed within, changing within. And that happens here with salt. If there's something changing in your body, changing in your taste buds, you will not taste that. So is there something within us that is drifting? Is there something within us that is, that is starting to wade, wade away from God? 
Think of that song, Give Me Jesus. If you're singing that song with a cold, callous heart, if it doesn't mean anything to you, may I suggest that there may be a drift going on? May I suggest that, you, that there's a possibility of losing that first love? May I suggest that what God is wanting to do in your heart is being stripped away by outside and internal influences? That's why I often say if worship is boring, if worship is hard, if it's distracting, if you can't say, sing, sing, oh, Jesus, I love you, oh, how I love you, but you can't wait to watch the Dodgers, something is wrong. In the heart, there might be a drift that is happening. And with your permission, I'm going to add another sola, if I can. 500 years later, are you ready for this one? <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink first on this one. Because this is going to hit home. Sola is the Latin, but the word after it is not. It's English. Ready? Sola action. Put feet to our faith. Put feet to our faith. This is a big issue in the American church. I recently read a quote. We're professing believers, but practical atheists. That had to sink in for a minute because it's very easy to believe. It's very easy to be here. But when have we went out and actually put feet to our faith? When was the last time many of you here visited the hospital homes? When was the last time you reached out to the homeless in our community? When was the last time that we, that we did something. See, it's not meant, and this is hard, trust me, I struggle too. It's not just about absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. It's about absorbing God and then giving it out. I mean, it's interesting. There's, a, there's a, uh, something they're doing in Lancaster. I might talk about this more for in, in, a, in a little bit uh, in the, as the weeks come, but they're wanting to get the homeless people out of the cold this winter. And they're asking some churches to house them on certain nights and minister to them. And the first thought I had was wonderful. That sounds great. The second thought I had is would anybody be willing to do that? Because I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired of being fed up on this. Fed. Fed up is probably not the right word. But being fed, right, on the Word of God, but then not giving it out. That's why many people are stifled in their growth. That's why they're angry and unproductive. Because you aren't designed to just take in and take out. That's actually selfishness. As a fellow struggler, right? Uh, right here admitting it. It's the hard part. Learn. I mean, I can sit to, I can read the Bible all morning. I can listen to Air One on the radio. I can put on apps. I can listen to Jim Cimbala's book on tape. Put on my Bluetooth. I can do all these things. Feed me, feed me, feed me. But when it comes to putting faith, feet to our faith, that's where we can look practically like atheists. And it, it, that is meant to cut a little deep. It is meant to challenge. We also have something we're going to talk about at the end of the service about uh, water wells and bringing water to children that have to walk miles and miles and miles to just get water. Is anyone convicted or is it just me? I remember growing up, you had to park your car outside. And then something built called a garage comes from a french word in the early 1900s to house a vehicle and if one car garage wasn't enough guess what came out and then when my short time in real estate everybody wanted to get a house with a Just this week, I thought about those things. It just—it really—it hurt my heart. Because how? It, 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 see, we don't notice. See, we get very—I'm very good at staying to the truth in my mind. But we don't realize how far we've drifting when it comes to putting our feet into motion. Because God didn't save us just to save us; He saved us to make a difference. And how blessed we are. I'm not joking about three-car garage. Now there's 
four car garages and then all these storage units to do what see we got we really have to put this stuff in perspective sola action sola action this is where the rubber meets the road this is where it's going to hurt a little bit we've got to do something with our faith so i am going to lovingly challenge this congregation on some of these things in the weeks to come And it's hard. I, I get frustrated, maybe just in my own self, but I'll get emails that, you know, Shane, we need more helpers. We need more servers in the hospital homes ministry. We don't have enough people that can go visit them on Sundays. People that are looking forward, the whole week, they're looking forward to Sunday afternoon when we bring the church to them. And I see the email. I sometimes get mad, maybe mad at myself. Maybe I could do more. We don't have enough people. To, hold on, let me get this straight. We don't have enough people to go and visit, take an hour or two out of their day and go visit these people who desperately need to know about the love of God. There's a problem there. And again, I'm not coming up here with the whip because as Leonard Ravenhill said, you need to weep before you whip. But it should touch our heart. This is the point. I mean, I, and, and maybe it's me. Maybe it's a season of life. But okay, preaching the word of God. Preaching the word of God. It's wonderful. We're getting imparted with, by truth. But if it doesn't produce action, if it doesn't produce us going out and making a difference, what is the point? Really? Because we're supposed to be going out and doing something so that's the first part of sola action is put feet to our faith. The next part about action is we do need to go back to the old paths. Go back to the old paths. Do you remember? Do you remember when this meant everything? Some of you are there, I know, but some of you, you've drifted off that old path. The Bible says go back, return to the old path. Return, and I, and I thought about this a week. Where are they today? Where are these guys where are these guys? Where are the, are the white cliffs who stood so unyielding for the truth that he was called the morning star of the Re Reformation? Where is the Tyndales and the Husses who were burned at the stake for simply declaring the truth of God's word? Where are the Martin Luthers who when he was faced by his executioner, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Where are the Eurek Zwingli's who preached in Switzerland so boldly that he was often being chased People wanted to kill him. Where are the John Knoxes? I love John Knox. You should read this guy's biography. He said, give me Scotland for the cause of Christ or I shall die. Where's that today? Who's saying, give me Lancaster? God, give me Lancaster. Give me Palmdale. Give me this Leona Valley. Give me it for the cause of Christ or I shall die. The reason they're feeling that is they feel the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and they have to do it. George Whitfield, who brought the UK and America to her knees. D.L. Moody who stood so unyielding for the truth. Richard, uh, uh, Richard Baxter the Puritan who said I preach as a dying man to dying men. Where are they today? Yes, I know they're here and they're there. Don't get me wrong. But we need to put action back into our faith. So I'll leave you with the closing prayer. I'll leave you with our closing action. Our prayer is this. 25, Psalm 25, 5. And I prayed this many times this week. God, lead me. Lead me in your truth. God, lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Are you praying that, Lord, lead me to your truth? Because you better be praying that because if you're not praying it, guess what direction you might be going? M remember, the human heart by default is, is already set on sin. Let me just turn this dial on sin. So if I don't do anything, that's the direction I'm going. So, oh, there's another prayer. Lead me not into temptation. Jesus said, pray like this, lead me not into temptation. So our prayer this morning should be, God, lead me into your truth. Teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. 
For you I wait. Did you know that hurry is the arch enemy of devotion? Hurry, 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 hurry. Going here. You cannot be devoted to God in that sense of, of seeking Him. You know, many of you know right now that when you can spend that time away with God, you are a new person because the Spirit's being built up and the flesh is being crucified. We have a retreat that men go to, women go to. It's, it's twice a year. Talk to Mike Livingston after the service. We just had a group of guys come back from it and a group of women there right now. They are being transformed by the power of God. Anytime you take that little thing in your pocket that beeps all the time, you shut it off and you say, Lord, I'm going to seek you. Guess what? Within an hour, you have withdrawals. We don't realize how hurried we've become. And that's the enemy of devotion. That's what's happening. It says just wait. For, we don't know how to wait anymore, do we? Try going to New York. Oh, my goodness. Nobody knows how to wait. Fast pace, fast pace, fast. Everything's so fast paced. Go and wait. He says, just wait on me. And then our action this week needs to be Lamentations 3, 40 through 41. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Isn't that powerful? And Lamentations, who would have ever thought? Lamentations is Jeremiah lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem because of the sins of the people. So he's encouraging people, let us search out. See, no matter how far you've drifted, no matter how far you've gone, let us search out and examine our ways. Isn't it interesting? Search. Search means to examine and to investigate. Does my lifestyle line up with God's word or do I need to tighten my grip? Examine ourselves. Turn back to the Lord. Lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. See, as a result of turning back to God, I begin to worship. It's interesting. There's a whole debate in the church, right? The hand raisers, the non-hand raisers, the suit and the tie, the not suit and tie, the charismatic songs, the conservative songs, the hymnals, the contemporary, the suit and tie, the this attire. You know, you have those different things going. The worship wars. There's whole books written on the worship wars. But the bottom line, when your hearts turn back to God, just like it said here, let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. See, to me, it's actually a point of submission. Because to do this 25 years ago, I would have laughed at you. Bunch of God babies, worships for women. That's, what is this? I mean, we'll praise our favorite team. Won't we? Look at that. We're, because see, it's what's happening in the heart. That's why people, how many people jumped off the couch? I can't believe it. I can't, did you see that hit? Did you see all that? Did you, what are they doing? They're excited. They're worshiping. So that's all it is when it says we lift up holy hands to the Lord. Our hearts are on fire for him. We want to worship. We want to, because it's what's happening in the heart. See, I don't know about you, but I can't, I can't just sit there and like, let's get through these. Gosh, 30 more minutes. Ugh. I can't do that any more than I could tell my kids to just sit outside of Disneyland for three hours and do nothing. Why? What's going on in the heart? So you have to wonder. And I was convicted at Tuesday night in New York. 3,000 people, I'd say 2,500, were not ashamed to worship. They were worshiping it. That sound was just penetrant. And if people were all nationalities black, white, red, blue, yellow, all languages. Now, it doesn't matter. You don't worship more the more you turn up the volume. You do have people that act weird. That's not worship. But if something is happening in your heart, if God grips my heart, isn't there, isn't there an emotional response? Isn't there something, God, I just want to worship you, something in my heart? I mean, tell the father who saw his prodigal son coming to just settle down. Just settle down. Just wait for him. Just sit at the table and wait. What did that father have to do? He ran to the son. He ran. You tell the blind men who were just healed to be quiet. See, action is a normal response. It's a God-given response when something 
vital happens. So think about that verse as we worship. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven.